We're talking about shunning the ways of Jahiliyyah. And in the farewell sermon, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about many different aspects, and amongst them, he mentioned the ways of Jahiliyyah. And from the ways of Jahiliyyah were bid'ah that were rampant. It was oppressing the poor and so many other things, and of course, oppressing women. And because of that, I wanted to talk today about the oppression of women. And my argument is that there was only a short period in human history where women were not oppressed, and then before that they were oppressed, and today, until today, they're oppressed, and they cannot escape certain ideas and ideologies. So this is what I call being trapped by an idea. And many Muslim women today, even though Islam came to really liberate them, they're still trapped by certain ideas or ideologies. For example, until now, Muslim women will ask you certain questions that they really shouldn't be asking. They'll ask you things like, why is it that a Muslim man can marry four and a Muslim woman cannot marry four? And this is a question, if you contemplate for four minutes, you'll find the answer. It's not a difficult question. It's very clear why. <laughs> you, know, you can ask the sister, is that what you want for yourself? No. Okay, do you know a bunch of sisters who are fighting for that? Look, who are you making this argument for? Did you consider this for one minute? Do you know what it means to marry four men? And cook for four men and clear for four men <laughs> and have children for four men? What kind of an argument is that? Yeah? And be a, you, you have one deadbeat husband, now I have four, mashallah. <laughs> men are barely doing their job anyways, and you want three more jerks like him. Fantastic. You know something? Muslim women will come and ask you, why is it that men pray in the front and women pray in the back? And they're always angry when they ask you that question. I want you to introduce me to this guy who taught you that there's something wrong with praying in the back. That it's offensive to, pay, to pray in the back for some reason. I want, to, I want to meet this guy. And what's his logic? What's his reasoning? Why do we accept this argument that if you're in the front, you're better than the one in the back? Yeah? Maybe in the buses when they did it in the Americas, it was different. Yeah? The coloreds are in the back and all that. But this is not the same situation. And you're a Muslim woman. You know how women pray. Do you cons did you consider for a minute what would happen if women prayed in the front and the men prayed in the back? And that would be the only time brothers will really fight for the front row, right? <laughs> I mean, like, there's no room, brother, there's some room, just push, move over a little bit, yeah? Everybody, Imam, please make the sujood very long, Yeah? It's the only time there's khushu. Did you consider that? I mean, if you consider it for a moment, you'll see that it doesn't make any sense. Why was there no male prophet ever sent? Okay, so what? Suppose now, there was a female prophet sent 15,000 years ago. Would that make you a better person sitting here today? Would that make you sit a little bit higher perhaps? Okay, all the prophets were males. Does that mean the brothers now today are a bit better believers because all the prophets are males? Are your brothers, are you sitting any taller because all the prophets were males? It means nothing to you. It means nothing to you. But people are trapped by these ideas and they can't escape them. And so we wanted to do a quick summary, and perhaps we'll not do it justice, but 2,500 years of what uh, the ideologies that are related to women went through in these 2,500 years. And what we always want to say is that um, the, the radical feminist movement has made life a battle between the sexes. Life is a battle between men and women to see you know, who will become victorious. And we always tell sisters that, sisters, there is no battle between men and women. There is no conflict between men and women. And do you know why? Because we already won. <laughs> See, they didn't laugh at that one. No, I'm just kidding. There is no battle between the sexes. There is no war. There is no fight. You know, I said this recently and a sister said, we both win. That still implies there's a challenge. There's some kind of uh, competition. There is no competition. So, let's do a, an un... Well, a very brief summary of like 2,000 plus years of ideologies concerning women. You go as far back as Aristotle, and he in his writings mentioned that the, the women are mentally, in, meaning in a way, mentally inferior to men, that they are deficient in understanding and they cannot be trusted. This is Aristotle. And other Greek philosophers as well wrote to that effect. So now you add these ideas that we already have from the Greek philosophers, to when Christianity appeared, and that added all kinds of other issues on top of that as well. So the early Christians contemplated the life of Jesus, and they saw that he never got married. So they concluded that to not get married is better than to get married. 
And so they innovated Rahbaniya or celibacy into their religion. And Allah says in the Quran, وَرَحْبَانِيَةً ابْتَدَعُوهَا And the celibacy which they innovated into the religion. Allah did not ask them of it, but they put it into the religion. Because they saw Jesus not getting married, so therefore that is the best thing. Add that to the idea in Genesis where the blame of the fall of man, if you read the book of Genesis and the Bible, was entirely put on the woman. So the woman is the reason for the fall of one, man. The woman is the reason that man was taken out of paradise, that man ate from the tree, and so on and so forth. The Bible puts all the blame on the woman. Well, in the Quran, the blame is not put on the woman, and it's not put on the shaitan either. Allah Azza wa says, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ Yeah? So basically, Adam disobeyed his Lord. Not Eve caused him or the shaitan caused him. Adam disobeyed his Lord. The blame was put on him. So now we start to see Jesus being celibate, not getting married as a, as a bachelor. And with the writings of Genesis, the woman being the cause of all evil. So early Christian writers began to say that women are the cause of evil and they are evil. And as a result of that, they also began to look at intimacy as an, as an evil and a dirty thing. Being intimate with your wife is a very bad thing. And they started to say that you only do that if you want to have children. Only for the sake of procreation, not for the sake of enjoyment or anything else. As an interesting note, until today in America we have laws that discuss, that govern certain things concerning that. These are laws that are just strange laws that are in the books. Obviously they're not uh, enforced or, or what have you. But it just shows you the effects of that, the, that thinking. As a result of that, you see how these things snowball now. As a result of this now, concluding that intimacy is a bad thing and a dirty thing, they also concluded that the paradise is spiritual and not physical. That paradise is only on the spirit and not this. Why? Because it doesn't make sense that you can enjoy something which is bad and dirty. There shouldn't be anything dirty in paradise. So therefore they had to conclude that paradise now is spiritual. That's why there's no intimacy in it. And of course this is a concept that doesn't make sense to them. And even in their, in their movies and their writings and their books, how do they portray paradise? Physical. Because it doesn't make sense that it's spiritual. How can a spirit enjoy things? Every time you take a drink from the nice drinks of Jannah and it just spills all over, on the ground again. Try to pop a, a, a grape and it just flies the other way. Now, now you're upset with your... I am going to fire these servants of mine. Every time they pour the drink, I just... <laughs> so... It doesn't even make sense to them that it would be spiritual. But all this as a result of this spiral, this effect, yeah? So then what happens? Then the early Christians, they encountered the Muslims for the first time. And when they first encountered Muslims, they were very surprised to find that Muslims marry four. By the way, sisters, if you follow this, this chain of, of, process, of, of thoughts here, you will see now why the West has issues with their hijab if you pay attention. So they first came into contact with the Muslims and they concluded that these, that these Muslims must be oversexed because a man can marry four, you get 71 or, or whatever number of virgins in, in paradise. And this was until after 9-11, this was a very big problem. This was a very big problem for them. And they kept writing about it to those of you who, who were in the States or North America, or maybe even some of it came down here, that you know, constantly they talk about the Hur al -Ain in the newspapers and on the television programs. And some imams buckled under the pressure. One speaker said, no, no, Hurain, they're not women, they're cotton flowers. Yeah? <laughs> and Allah says, وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورٍ We wed them to cotton flowers. But what are you going to do with a cotton flower? <laughs> Smell it. And kiss it. Kiss it. What are you going to do with it? It's ridiculous. But he buckled under pressure. Okay? So, Brother Farhan Nur, if it doesn't work out, there, I'm sure there are <laughs> cotton flowers around the city. So, so what happens now is they start to see that these Muslims must be oversexed. That's why um, it's so casually mentioned. It's not a dirty thing in Islam. They look in Surah Al-Baqarah and they found intimacy with the wife mentioned in the middle of the verses of I'tikaf, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's not a bad thing. It's not a dirty thing. So then they concluded that's why these Muslims are like that. And they even some of the early Christian, Christians, when they first encountered the Muslims and they saw the Muslim women fully covered, they said the, these Muslim women are fully covered because if they weren't covered, these wild savage men would attack them. That's why they're so covered. And then you get all this, this uh, fantastical construct uh, where 
the, the harem, for example, and all kinds of things from Hollywood. The harem is a ridiculous concept, basically. It's this woman, as you've seen images of the, what the harem is supposed to look like, a woman that is scantily clad, but mashallah, tabarakallah, she's still wearing niqab. Yani. Everything else is exposed, but she's wearing niqab. She has some kind of haya. Don't, don't, yani, don't write her off completely. Likewise, if you remember, in those of you early enough, old enough to remember, in the early Hollywood movies, they always portrayed the Arab as what? Always this oversexed guy. Always, if you look at the early movies, always has busted up broken teeth, one eye is looking this way, one eye is looking the other way. And the Arab always, in all these early movies, asks one question, how much? How much? Even until more recent movies, yeah? I don't want to give too many titles, and just so you know, this is my field of study, okay? It is. I studied communications. We focus on media production. So we study this kind of stuff, right? So in the early movies, always the Arab was the guy just crazy after women. In the 80s, they had a series of movies about racing, cannonball run. The Arab was always a crazy guy wanting women. Even until more recent ones, there's a movie with this horrendously horrible actor, uh, Van Damme, right? And Bloodsport. And you remember there's a guy with a ghutra. He looks Cambodian, but they put a ghutra on him. And he's this, uh, the Arab guy. And he wanted to take the white woman up to his room and everything. And then they had that game where they take the coin out of his hand. Again, it was that image of the Arab being crazy like that. Then what happens? Uh, so we're, we're looking at the, like this is continuing now. And even until like 50 years before the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu bishops were gathering in France to debate whether or not the woman had a soul. Yeah. Then the West starts to go through a number of things that, that bring them to where we are now. Uh, one of them being the Enlightenment era. And in this period of time, they went through a number of different, uh, like re-examining a lot of thoughts, some of them being scientific. And that's when they start to say that's the earth that revolves around the sun and not the other way around. Some of them being theological, Martin Luther King protesting against some issues in the Catholic Church. And some of them being social. And the social issues dealt with women. And so now, for the first time, we start to see some kind of writings. Even though, still, even despite this, we see, we see the philosophers like Voltaire, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which is like a, a Genevan philosopher. And he writes a book uh, named, uh, entitled Emile. And this was written about 1757. They say it's written between 19, 1757 to 1761, anywhere in that time period. And in it, he writes about the, they should have education for women, but it needs to be uh, according to their lower intellect and according to what they could understand. And then later on in the 1800s, you start to see others like Mary Wollstonecraft and so on, writing about you know, women's rights and so on. But then comes the Industrial Re Revolution. And in the Industrial Revolution, you have, especially in England, a lot of women entering the workforce. And you start to, for the first time, hear about demand of equal pay. They're working the same number of hours as the man, so we should get equal pay. You start to see these as, these are just briefly some of the stepping stones. And then after that, the, the West also goes through, in the 60s, 70s, they go through what is known as the sexual revolution. So after the sexual revolution, they, they see promiscuity, there's nothing wrong with it, all kinds of, of deviance, there's nothing wrong with that. So now what happens, so when they were far to the right and the Muslims were in the middle, they looked at the Muslims and they said, you guys are so far to the left. You guys are extreme. Then the West, after the sexual revolution, goes so far to the left, and then they look again at the poor Muslims who are still in the same place and say, you guys are so far to the right. So now after the sexual revolution, they're saying, you Muslims, you're too uptight. There's no intermingling. The women are covered. Now, sisters, you understand why if a nun is walking in front of someone and she's dressed like a Muslimah, nobody says anything. Then a Jewish woman walks by and she's dressed, again, like a Muslimah, an Orthodox Jewish woman, and nobody says anything. And the minute the Muslim woman walks by, they're like, she's oppressed, poor thing. They're forcing her to wear that. Why are you the only one forced to wear that? It goes back to this, this idea here. So after the sexual revolution, they start to tell the Muslims that you guys are too uptight. You guys are not relaxed enough in your society. So the Muslims were always in the same place, but they're moving around right and left. So, so now you understand why there's always this issue with the Muslim woman wearing hijab and so on and so forth. So now they, they, they got to the point, they got to this point by questioning values. You questioned the writings of Plato, Aristotle, uh, St. Thomas of Aquinas, again, who's one of those writing, again, degrading the woman the arguments of is a woman a full human being or not, all these issues. 
they got to a point where they start to question all these values and all these ideologies. And then they went to another extreme, like in the 90s when they brought up the issue of gender, that there is actually no difference between the male and the female, it's just all about upbringing. And if they're brought up the same way, they'll be exactly the same. And in Islam, we don't have a problem with differences between men and women, because that's part of being fair. When you're fair, you recognize differences. When you're unfair, you, try to, you, you assume that everyone is exactly the same and should be treated exactly the same way. I'll give you an example. There was um, like a mayor or, or some governor, someone in charge in California. And this man, he was a pervert and an idiot. <laughs> he was, you will see why. Because he said, why is it that a man can go topless in the beach and the woman can't? One more time, he was a pervert and an idiot. Now you understand. <laughs> it's very clear, right? So, I mean, you, you don't know why? You don't know why? You don't see that they're phys physically different? That's why. So in Islam, to treat two different things as equal in every respect is a form of injustice. Imagine in Islam, the woman in her final trimester in pregnancy still had to fast like everybody else. No excuses. You're all equal. Yes, we're all equal in the sense that this is a human, this is a human. This will be held accountable, this one will be held accountable. But to say that yes, you have to fast, the man fasts, you fast. Would that be fair? It wouldn't be fair. So to treat different things as exactly equal is a form of injustice. That's why we have different fiqh rules and regulations for men and for women. But in the other sense, of course, no one would argue that they're equal. So then they got into the extreme of saying the whole gender issue and that there's no such thing as sex. It's just basically the gender and how you, you raise the individual. This was another extreme. So what's happening is that the, the way women, Western women, or women in the West got to the point that they are today is by challenging these values and challenging these ideologies. One of the problems is that we know, of course, and, and we all will agree, that the Muslim woman today is not in a good situation, if you consider the Muslim lands. They're not in a good situation, but it has nothing to do with Islam. It has to do with cultures, it has to do with ideologies, it has to do with all kinds of other things that keep women down, not because of the teachings of the religion. But unfortunately, many women who want to, quote unquote, liberate the Muslim woman, they, they, they use exactly the wrong tactic. They want to attack the religion, which is exactly the vehicle that is supposed to get them out of the situation that they're in. This worked for the West because the values they had were written by men and humans. But our values were from Allah Azza wa Jal and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't challenge these values. That's the same vehicle that will get you out of the bad situation. You don't destroy that vehicle. So, so with this issue then of women being liberated, are they truly liberated today? And this is one of the things, for example, let's just pick hijab. People want to attack hijab. And so why are you wearing hijab? You're oppressed, all these arguments. And f leave the hijab. Let's see what happens when you remove the hijab. Do you, are you liberated when you remove the hijab? And I always quote this, uh, this uh, a student at the UCLA University in, in California. And she was a, a senior, a psychology major. And she made an experiment. She was a, a Chinese-American lady who was not a Muslim. And she experimented with hijab. Maybe some of you have, have read what he, her, her experiment was. She put on hijab. And then she went out. And then she wrote this article. And it was really incredible her insights and the things that she discovered at, when putting on hijab. So she says, by, by covering myself, I did not cover my femininity. The only thing I covered was, was my sexuality. She said, covering the latter allowed me to express more the former. And the more I covered my sexuality, the more I could be free and be an individual and be a human being. And this is exactly the problem today. So if hypothetically a woman enters into a meeting room, there's a meeting, and the woman is not dressed properly. Let's say she's quote unquote attractive and she's dressed very, very improperly. She walks into a meeting room. What is the first thing the men will think? Oh, she's very intelligent, mashallah. <laughs> this will be a productive meeting. <laughs> no, they're going to look at her as a sexual object. That's all they're gonna do. That's all they'll see. So the, no matter what she does, no matter how hard she studies and reads and how eloquent she is, she still is looked at as just a sexual object. The minute she covers that, she will be looked at as an individual. And there were many studies that, that, that were done. There was a university in Brussels that did a study on uh, the inversion effect, something called the inversion effect. It's basically the inversion effect deals with the human being's inability 
to recognize faces when they're upside down. And you've probably all seen images upside down, a face upside down, and you have a, a, t a tough time recognizing the individual. Now, we don't have a problem as human beings in recognizing objects that are upside down. You see any object upside down and you know exactly what the object is. But when you see a face upside down, you have to struggle and sometimes you can't figure out who the individual is. So in the University of Brussels, they made this study and they found out that men had a hard time recognizing faces of other males upside down, but they had no problem recognizing the faces of women when they were upside down, just like they could see objects when they were upside down. So they concluded in this study that men view women as objects. Men view women as objects. Likewise, there is another university, University of, of Kansas, and they did a similar study, and they actually tested women, and they came to the same conclusion, that women saw other women as objects as well. Because this, that's what the society trained them. A splash of colors on their faces, and wear this and wear that, and do all kinds of things to their appearance. So even women would see other women as objects. Now, in the University of Michigan in 1989, they had a similar study. This is obviously a lot older. This study was conducted in 37 countries. And in these 37 countries, they also found all people throughout these countries saw women as objects as well. So what if someone says, well, this, proof, this is proof that it's not just the West who has this issue. It is proof, we're using it as an argument to say hijab. When you don't have hijab, that's how men look at the woman. Because the woman, the man, Allah created the man, he is... He is uh, attracted or he is aroused by looking. So if he sees a woman as an object, no matter what country where and what religion he's from, that's what she will be, an object. And that's why if you look at, um, for example, let's just pick on the United States of America. In America, we cannot accept a woman in a high leadership position if she looks like a woman, if she's effeminate. So she has to look what we call androgynous in the English language, right? So the androgynous woman, that's the one that has short hair, that wears these business suits, that doesn't show her emotions and acts more like a man, right? So if you look at Western women in very high and powerful positions, you'll always find that they have this look. Let's start with your Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. And because she recently passed away, a lot of you, even though you're too young to remember uh, her time, you've probably watched the documentaries about her life, and you've probably noticed that part where uh, for in the beginning, in her political career, she was very effeminate. And her voice was very high-pitched. Any of you remember that? I mean, from the documentary? Yeah? So her voice was very high-pitched, right? And then her advisors told her to make her voice deeper. Yeah? And that's why, she, after, if you l listen to her videos, she's always like, I met with the president of Pakistan. And it's like deeper then. Then she retires from politics. And her voice is high again, because now I don't have to do this for men anymore. So the men couldn't accept her when she had this high feminine voice. So now she's got short hair, she's wearing these business suits, walking around like this, deep voice, because a man can't accept a woman in the West if he sees her beautiful, if she sees that she's effeminate. Because that's for him, that's a sexual object. I'm not going to take orders from a sexual object. I need you to look more like me, like a man. And let's go throughout, uh, through a lot of the Western women leaders for example, we had Condole uh, no, we had the, what's that? Um, Madeleine Albright, for example. Again, short hair, frown, that business suit. Uh, we had one that all the comedians were constantly making fun of her as being a man during the Clinton era as well. Uh, who was it? No, uh, Clinton. Uh, anyway, no, Clinton era, yani. And uh, so basically. Janet Reno, thank you very much. And Janet Reno was always a man for the comedians. She had short hair again. She came in like a man like that. Then you have Hillary Clinton. And again, short hair, these business suits. When she was running against Obama in the, pre in the presidential elections, you would read what they write about her. her, her, her their critiques of her is that she was stoic, meaning she did not show emotion. She was uh, very, like, very dry, didn't cry, all these things, not very woman-like. Then one day... She choked a little bit as she was speaking, and I actually think she was faking. It didn't even look real, but she <laughs> pretended to choke just to show that she has some feelings, and guess what? Immediately the next day, do we really want a woman who cannot control herself first? So, like as they say in English, damned if you do and damned if you don't. So what do you want from this lady in the end? Then we also had uh, Condoleezza Rice, but uh, she was a real man, of course. 
So <laughs> she was. Um, so, so what's happening then is that we start to see that people are not able to accept the woman in a place in a leadership position because for in a lot of countries now, not just picking on the West anymore, for in a lot of countries the woman is just a sexual object and you can't take orders from a sexual object. So then even though women think they've been liberated, they are still trapped and they're still stuck. They still have these problems. How can you escape that? And what we argue to people is that the escape and the way out of that is through Islam. And for Muslim women, it's through Islam. That's the only way you will win over all these millions and millions of oppressive men. Yeah, that's the only way to use Islam. But like I said, some women, they start to attack Islam. They start to attack the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They even start to question the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an. There was a, a, a woman in the United States, a revert, who doesn't speak Arabic, but she said she's going to reevaluate the sahih ahadith of al-Bukhari. They asked her, how are you going to do it? She said, basically, I'm going to read the hadith and I'm going to think about it. And if it does not agree with the woman's point of view, it's weak. Okay, so she's going to, okay, first of all, like I said, she doesn't, it's interesting, she doesn't speak Arabic. So she's going to rely on the translation of some man overseas who is paid minimum wage. <laughs> and she's going to use that to decide of the hadith. The second thing, the, did we have like a vote and the majority of the world's sisters liked you and said, yes, we want you to do this for us? So the problem is they try to reevaluate and they try to challenge some of the known established values of Islam. So if we couldn't agree on what the Prophet ﷺ said, what on earth makes you think we can agree on what some strange sister said? And I always liken this when you want to attack Islam, which is the vehicle that will save you, to having a uh, to make this long journey across the desert and you only have your camel and then after two days throughout, uh, into the journey you stop, you slaughter and you eat your camel. You basically just killed the vehicle that's supposed to get you across. So how do you expect to make this? And we've seen some crazy things written by, by, by some people claiming this is how to get their, their freedom or to get their rights. They think that their fight is with Islam. Islam never ever oppressed women. Your fight is not with Islam. Your fight is with all these cultures. It's with all these men. It's with all these, whatever these, are, whoever it is, wherever they are, but it's not Islam. And people sometimes don't know like, where the problem is and they don't know how to pick their battles. So we've, like there was one, and she was saying that, uh, she was challenging the authentic hadith, and she said that there are certain hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in Sahih Bukhari that are misogynistic. And you know what misogyny is? It's hating women and hating girls. So she said the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu are misogynistic and therefore they need to be thrown away. And others in their, in their way of understanding this is they attack the narrations of the hadith. Every time I'm going down a road and there's a hadith in the middle of the road, let me just chop it down. That's the most unintellectual way of, ch of dealing with an issue. Hadith says this, oh, that's the only thing standing in my way now, this hadith. It's weak to the point where, and this is very recently where we were reading this, uh, we we're at a conference and someone presented this paper at the conference saying that, the, uh, that, that some of the hadith have narrators from the companions that were not trustworthy. And if you look at the muhaddithin, mu mu they, they say that the companions are all udul, the companions are all trustworthy. We don't say this companion was not trustworthy narrator because these are the people who brought us the Quran. And the Qur'an was preserved in the same way as the Sunnah. So if we start to throw doubt on the companions, then it's going to open the door to attacking the Qur'an, all kinds of other things. So they said that Abu Bakr, and it narrates a hadith, he said, they said Abu Bakr was untrustworthy, and to quote them, that he was also a convicted felon. But is that the situation? First of all, no one said he was untrustworthy. Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhum, he was a, a, a companion, and, uh, and basically what he had seen was that he, he thought he saw Al-Mughir ibn Shu'bah committing a fornication or zina. But what had happened is Al-Mughir ibn Shu'bah was married to this woman, but he was married to her in secret. And Umar anhu forbade getting married in secret. So he couldn't say this is my wife, so he kept it to himself. So Abu Bakr came 
uh, with some, some of the, uh, his name was Nufay ibn al-Harith, and he came with some of the companions. Then one of them withdrew. So now we don't have four witnesses, there are three. So he was punished for that, and the Quran says that his, his testimony is not to be accepted. And Umar would tell him, Tub aqbal shahadatuk, that make tawbah, I will accept your testimony. But uh, he didn't want to uh, re like refuse or like uh, recant his testimony. So basically what happened is that in this issue, yes, his testimony would not be accepted in court. That doesn't make him a not reliable narrator of the hadith. The point is that the attempt to get women out of a bad situation is now through attacking Islam, attacking hijab. Oh, hijab is just a custom of the Arabs, okay? And, and you see this, like, <laughs> debates, women debating is it hijab or niqab or what is the other thing? Convertible, whatever, yani. There are all kinds of hijab, right? Uh, all kinds of different names. The convertible is the one that comes up and down. Yeah. So a lot of times it's up, you know. And then there's hijab that we call sample. That's the one where it's a proper hijab, but there's a hair sample sticking out. <laughs> and then there's useless hijab. That's when the woman covers every little bit of hair, and she's wearing very, very tight clothing. So who on earth told you that the hair strand is not as dangerous as body parts being yani, finely defined. Anyways, then these things make, yani, especially Muslim sisters dressed improperly like this in that kind of hijab, they make life difficult for people like, you know, Brother Farhan Noor and others. <laughs> you will regret ever giving me your name and telling me to make this joke. <laughs> Anyways, so, so the problem then so these are issues of jahiliyyah. The issues now that oppress, oppress women today, they're issues of jahiliyyah. They're not issues dealing with Islam. All the, the whatever it is, you, you just make your list. I don't even know the list. The honor killings and how, you know, the dowry is giving to the man. You guys got it good, man. This, this, recently, I was in Europe and this lady came to me. She said, this guy, um, this doctor, uh, we're engaged and he's demanding that my father buys him a house and furniture, I said, oh, excuse me? Like, what? He buy, he's a doctor and your father has to buy him a house? Like, yeah, that's how we do it. I'm not going to get married from this type of the world. <laughs> Anyways, the point is, <laughs> it's these, these ideologies have nothing to do with Islam. That's your fight. And of course, this is our fight too, right brothers? And, and we're okay with that. We're okay with women being in a bad situation today. And this is one of the problems that people just want from the religion what will make them comfortable. And they don't want from the religion what will take from them and make other people comfortable. Um, recently, we were sharing some male chauvinist jokes with uh, Sheikh Walid Basuni. And Sheikh Walid said something very interesting. He said, we don't have such extremely mean jokes in, in the Muslim lands about women. Like, and these were very, I'm not even going to repeat them. Like, very, very mean jokes, Yeah. And it's interesting, we don't, I can speak for the Arab world at least, in the Arab world we don't have such incredibly cruel and mean jokes. And that reflects something. So for the women who are in the West, they're still oppressed, they're still shackled, they cannot break free from being objects and objectified because that's how they are in the magazines, in the newspapers, on television, every commercial, even if it has nothing to do with a woman, you put a woman on it. So there's, they can never escape that. It's impossible for them to escape that. And these women who are shackled are coming to you who are semi-liberated because Islam liberates you from that side and then your culture and your society and your community puts you down from another side. So you're still semi. That's why I argued in the beginning that there's only a brief period of time around the time of the Prophet ﷺ and years after that where women were liberated and after that it just went downhill again. So these who are shackled are coming to you who are semi-liberated and telling you don't be oppressed. So the solution really is in Islam. That's our argument. I will stop here, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, jazakum khair very much for being an attentive audience. I would like to say that if you uh, benefited and enjoyed this lecture, my name is Kamal al-Makki. If you did not find this useful at all and you did not enjoy this, my name is Abu Isa Ni'matullah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.